Hi, greetings. Uh, we are looking at the Eightfold Path and we're wrapping it up with this session. And so that brings us to the uh, conclusion, which is concentration. This is one of my favorite areas of the Eightfold Path. You know, we looked at skillful understanding, skillful thinking, skillful speech, skillful action, skillful livelihood, our work, skillful, um, or was I, skill, skillful effort, skillful mindfulness, uh, we did that last week, and um, skillful concentration. We're in this area of our practice, uh, the meditation practice. Um, skillful effort kind of tells us, you know, that, that we put a little bit effort towards this spiritual practice, this meditation, and it, it explains the dividends, you know, the, the benefits from it, which are humongous, they really are. You know, we become happier in this life, but it also promises um, uh, more for the future for us as well. So much more that uh, the the uh, the Buddha saw his his past lives and his future lives and the li past lives of others and the future lives, and he was very very convinced that uh, we can eradicate these defilements, these um, fetters. Um, and the, the more we do so, the, the, the better our, our future life will be. But we don't necessarily have to believe in that in order for us to have the benefits of meditation come right out for us. And we're going to look at concentration, which is my, probably one of my favorite areas. Um, the reason being is that from a personal standpoint, I started doing uh, Vipassana. Um, well, to, to go back a little bit further, I started meditating, not, not having any idea what I was doing. You know, I was in the middle of nowhere, no teachers, not much of an internet, you know, to fall back on or anything like that. No place to get my, my questions answered. And the uh, practice was kind of based on, I'm just going to do this every day until something happens. And benefits started to show up and then eventually I got teachers I started practicing um, more correctly I guess you could say very consistent but correctly uh, and I was doing a lot of uh, Vipassana types practices what people might refer to as mindfulness types of practice sitting in meditation uh, focusing uh, on the breath generally using the breath as a meditation object uh, the mind would wander off, and I'd kind of investigate what it wandered off to, um, whether it was you know one of the areas of mindfulness that we we talked about last week, whether it's something in the body or some feelings or some kind of state, mind state or a mood or emotion or something like this. Kind of look at it, investigate it, wonder wondering why my mind moved towards that. Um, looking at whether it went, moved towards the future or to the past or wherever it might have gone, and then bringing it back to the breath with the understanding that if I don't bring it back to the breath, it's just going to wander about like it, like it does most of the day, I guess, right? So the breath is like the foundation, you know, the, the coming home place. Um, we bring our attention back to the breath, and it might even stay there for a little bit longer. It might not. It might not stay there as long, but then it starts drifting off again. And we pay attention to it and kind of giving ourselves a point every time the, the not only, not only the, every time the, the mind wandered off, but whenever we noticed that, whenever we noticed that the mind was out there in la la land, we go, ah, okay, there's a point for me because I'm going to catch that and bring it back to the breath after doing a little bit of investigation. Now, concentration is a very similar practice, but, but different. Uh, we still use the breath, you know, that still is our, our object of meditation, but our intention is not to allow the breath, allow to, the mind to wander off, and not to dwell or investigate on what it wandered off to or anything like that, but to Bring it right back to the breath. Bring it back to the breath. Bring it back to the breath. Bring it back. And in hopes that the more we do that, the mind will fatigue and, and come to the agreement, you know, the understanding that, oh, okay, I'm just supposed to stay right here. 
And that is what we call single-pointed concentration, or sometimes one-pointedness, is it's called. Um, and it, it could also be called absorption because it feels as if we and our object are one, like we've kind of absorbed into our meditation object. Or maybe we could say our object absorbed into us. It really doesn't matter, but our object being the breath is now very easy to sit with and our mind does not wander away from that. That is concentration practice. Now, when we think of concentration by itself, concentration can be used in many, many different ways. And I would go so far as to say that the people that understood how important concentration were are the same people that um, you could say have been successful in certain areas in their life. They understood the importance of concentration in that they could concentrate on something and understand that all of these distractions are not allowing them to focus on what they want to focus. So they find some way to keep these distractions out of the picture and they go right to the heart of what they're concentrating on. And that's what concentration is. It's not so much the, the art, or it's not so much concentration, but it's what the distractions are and keeping distractions at bay or keeping them out of the picture whatsoever. Now, can you imagine, let's say somebody says, um, they, well, they give you a task and they say, you have to complete this task. Um, I'm going to give you uh, a ton of money. I'm going to give you a million dollars if you complete this task by the end of the week. Now, you're going to do whatever you can to complete that task. You're going to put your phone away if that's what it takes, and you're going to, you're, you're going to tell your, your partner and your friends and your family that, hey, leave me alone for this week because I'm going to do that task. Tell you all your friends and nobody's going to bother you and whatever it might be, you might lock yourself up into a, a, a room and then complete this task or whatever it might take. The reason I, I, I heard uh, writers do that, where they have to finish a, a project uh, quickly so they lock themselves in a hotel room and unplug the phone and they just sit there and work and work and work. I don't recommend that because the distraction could become a physical distraction. Um, you know, we can eliminate the, uh, the distractions out there, but the physical and the mental distractions are something else. And we're going to talk about that here in a second. Generally, when we are doing something like what I'm doing right now, I'm explaining something, I'm trying to in some ways think about what I said so I don't repeat it, what I'm going to say, um, try to put things in order so it's understandable, uh, talk legibly, things like that. Uh, but my subject is kind of broad. It's the idea of concentration itself. The subject is concentration. And so this is called what is called momentary uh, concentration. And if we we're going to use that as, let's use the example of a target, like the target that we find in sports. So there's a target there, and the, the, the target is the entire great big circle. Somebody says, take this dart and throw it into the target. It's this whole thing. That's the target. So. And then you might be talking to the person that's handing you the dart. You might notice somebody over here. You might notice what's behind the target. But you come back to the target from moment to moment. That's momentary concentration. And all of a sudden, you focus on the target, and you get ready to throw the dart. So you're focused on it. Then you throw the dart, but then your concentration goes someplace else after you throw the dart anyway. It's momentary concentration. And that's where most of us are most of the time. Um, we can focus on things for a moment, then we're on something else, we're on something else, we're, then we focus on it again. Um, kind of like multitasking with a bunch of different things. That's how the mind works. The, and the, the, by the way, multitasking is, is not a real thing. All we are doing is changing our, our, our objects of concentration. We're not actually able to work on two different things at one time. We're just changing. 
So the other aspect is called um, access concentration, and it's called access concentration is because we are getting to the point where we're um, we're really discovering something and training the the mind in the area of concentration. It's kind of like that person saying, I'll give you a million dollars if you can do this. And then all of a sudden your concentration becomes real good. You start developing ways to work with it. Um, you develop ways to cultivate concentration. And so you notice when you're concentrated on something and when you're not concentrated. When you're When you're really on it, you notice it when you're not on it you notice it as well and that's where most people meditate they pick a meditation object they focus on it and then the mind wanders off they're not on it then they come bring it back off on off on that's access because they're at, they're able to access concentration they're understanding concentration but that's not the kind of concentration we're talking about. We're talking about even deeper levels of concentration. Now, from there, we go into what is called absorption or one-pointedness. This is called, also called jhana. And I'll use that term jhana to mean uh, this type of practice concentration practice that we're talking about here. Jhana itself is when we are on the object and there's no distractions. So those hindrances that we've talked about, particularly in step six, the hindrances that hinder our concentration, they're also the hindrances that hinder our happiness and they hinder our feeling complete in the world. When we focus on an object and we rest our attention on that object, those hindrances are not there. If they are there, it's not jhana. That is the difference. The hindrances to refresh your memory are desire, um, aversion, or it could be called ill will, uh, restlessness and worry, sloth and tarpor, uh, fatigue, and doubt. Again, desire, ill will, uh, restlessness and worry, uh, sloth and tarpor, and doubt. Any of those things and a combination of those things, or maybe in some cases all five of them could be there to distract us from our object of meditation, which in this case we're referring to as the breath. And you notice when I speak about the breath, I usually go here because that's where I feel it, between the nose and the, the upper lip in this area right here. So. When we are in jhana, there's a little bit of thought, there's a lot of joy, a lot of happiness, and there's a considerable noticing of being able to stay on the object, just like you're on it and your mind isn't wandering off. So imagine that all, all of a sudden, you fall into this area of, of, of thought. Actually, it's an area of much, much less thought. And you realize that you are absolutely present. There is no past. There is no future. The thoughts that are there are so far in the background that they do not matter. You become instantly happy. You become joyful. Because all of the disturbances of the mind, all the discursive thoughts, all of the pain of the past, and all of the wondering and planning about the future are non-existence. They're stopped. And you are just resting in your own true nature. You're resting in peace and fulfillment. You're resting in concentration. This is jhana. And it's, it's, it's possible for everyone to do this. It's not some incredible state or anything like that. All it does take is daily practice of meditation. And I can't emphasize that enough. You must practice every day. And from time to time, if you're really interested in this jhana practice, you want to give it a good boost. You know, do a retreat or uh, lock yourself in a room for three hours and just concentrate on meditation. That's what it takes, these, these power 
power things, otherwise a daily practice. Power meditations, I could say, like a retreat. Uh, we do retreats, you know, we do a couple of day, day-long retreats uh, per month, and we do four-day retreats. We do about four of those a year, uh, and they're very important. I, I love them. So there's more, there's more to it than this. You know, it's more to it than just having the hindrances set aside. So the jhana factors are actually, um, they're applied thought, sustained thought. The, the applied thought are these, these, and the sustained thought are these thoughts way, way in the background. And then there's hap, uh, joy, blissfulness, and single-pointedness. And these are the factors. Don't, don't worry so much about those right now, but... Um, you can th- keep in track, keep ch- keep in mind that there are five jhana factors, and every time one of these jhana factors uh, is is present, it wipes out the five hindrances. Don't ask me why or how, but it just happens that way. The, the desire, the restlessness, and or the desire, the ill will or aversion, restlessness and worry, sloth and torpor, and and uh, doubt are eradicated by the uh, applied thought, sustained thought, joy, blissfulness, and single-pointedness. Now, if you could imagine how pleasurable that is, and it's, it's noticeably pleasurable. A lot of people think they actually became enlightened, have become enlightened when they reach first jhana. And I'm calling it first jhana because there are actually different levels. There's four jhanas. And there's, there's, there's jhanas beyond that, but we're going to explain the first four right now and a little bit about the other ones in a, in a second. But Now, imagine that we are meditating and we, we are very good at getting into that jhana. We sit down, we expect it. Our intention is to not dwell on the past or the future or not let the mind wander off. We come back we come to the breath and we stay there and we have that down so well that every time we come into meditation we sit in jhana that would become boring it actually does become boring and we wouldn't even have to admit that it's boring the the mind understands that when things become a routine and so what naturally happens is that thought that i was talking about that's in the background that that the, the the small talk you know we could say this the, the the small thought is completely gone and what is left is undescribable joy and blissfulness there is no thought and again there's no hindrances there's just joy blissfulness and single pointedness that is characteristic of the four or the the third jhana or the second jhana i'm sorry the second jhana there is absolutely no thought now and we thought that the first jhana was blissful this is even more blissful because it's 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 primarily this happiness this energetic joy you know this you know can't help sit there with a smile on our face and the, one of the amazing things about it is that we don't have to have a clock. We don't have to have a timer. We can say, I'm going to go into second jhana for an hour and 24 minutes. And we will go into jhana. And in exactly an hour and 24 minutes later, we'll come out. And we will come out of it knowing that it's a very, very powerful state. And that we realize that there is much, much more beyond just this existence because we, we proved it to ourselves again and again. We had our eyes closed and this inner happiness that is, is there. And it's like finding, uh, you know, like Huey Lewis says, I, I need a new drug. You know, it's, the, it's like a, finding a new drug and um, the, uh, the primary uh, benefit is, is happiness and joy. Now, I mentioned that that joy is energetic, and it is. The next jhana, the third jhana, that joy is gone. 
We're not, we're not adding. Remember, we're not adding to any meditations. Meditation is a renunciation, and this type of meditation, this jhana or concentration meditation, proves it. So now, even that energetic joy is gone. So I had to break this recording up. I'm sure the lighting is different and everything. But when we go into jhana three, uh, the, the joy, that energetic joy, uh, is it's as if that's too much for us and kinds of, kind of um, doesn't allow us to go to this even deeper place in our, in our concentration practice, in our jhana. So the joy uh, is too much energy, actually, although it's, it's, it's so subtle, but it's too much. And once that gone, it's just blissfulness, just like a, um, like the, like a breeze over a, a pond, but the breeze stops, so the pond is just like glass. And that actually has a very good example of, of you know, how this feels. It's, it's uh, um, different, different, uh, different things, things can come up in the mind, but essentially it's complete, still blissfulness. And uh, people, you know, can explain it in different ways, but it's such a deep concentration uh, that, and there's absolutely no thoughts. It's, it's quite, um, you know, th th that idea of blissfulness is really the best word, single word that describes it. So that's third jhana. And then we go into fourth jhana. In fourth jhana, the, the only thing that is really noticed is that our concentration is as just as if it's it's like a, a magnetically drawn to the object and it's adhered it's just right there at this point uh, time is absolutely no factor there's absolutely no thoughts happening um, the 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 energetic uh, joy is gone even the idea you know the mental idea of being blissful is not even present. It's, it's single pointed concentration and there's one thing that is added. And it's not really an addition, but, uh, but it is because it's the mind not moving this way or not moving that way, and that is equanimity. So single pointedness and equanimity are really the trademarks of the fourth jhana. And equanimity is when something is neither right or wrong or good or bad or pleasant or unpleasant, and, and, and there's no recognition of these things. So it's not the mind thinking, uh, I, I neither want it or don't want it. It's just that that doesn't exist. All, all of the, I'll use the word again, existence, but all of our existence is absolutely the way it's supposed to be. We're sitting in perfect single-pointed concentration with a heart, mind, and of, of equanimity. There's absolutely no, no duality at all. It's a state that uh, is, is actually beyond blissfulness because it doesn't have that, that kind of energy. And we can sit in this in the fourth jhana for um, for hours and hours and hours if we if we would choose to do so the whole idea about these th this jhana this type of concentration is that it sounds so supernatural to us that it's such a high power but yet we get very 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 tiny glimpses of this perhaps throughout the day Maybe not the fourth jhana, but but certainly the, the 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 first and the second jhana, where we go into these deep states of concentration. But without the practice of this, we have we have absolutely no control, and that's the that's the point. That's the idea is to gain control over this jhana, this practice, and that's why we want to do it again and again and again and again. To kind of recap things, we have this uh, this momentary concentration where we're looking at the the target, um, the target that we have in sports. You know, the 
like, like a bullseye, but it, it's the bullseye is in the middle. We're talking about the, the whole target. And we look at the target, and we look at some other things. We go back to the target, and we look at other things. And then, so we're, we're, we know that the target is there. Um, the next level is momentary concentration, concentra or I'm sorry, access concentration, where we are, we know the target is there, and we know how to work with it. We're focused on the target. We actually know that there's a bullseye there. And we actually figure out ways how to reach that bullseye with our with our our target, you know, the bullseye as our target. And so we have access into these these deeper areas of concentration. Now, single pointed concentration is jhana, and that's when we are focused on the bullseye, and we can hit it, and we can hit it very, very, very consistently. We get into deeper states of of, of jhana. Uh, we could say that we're constantly hitting the bullseye, and it's very easy and very, um, uh, very blissful to do that. This is kind of a, a different kind of analogy that we might use for concentration, but I think it's quite effective. So this is jhana. Uh, it's a little bit different than, than mindfulness or what is called vipassana meditation. Vipassana meditation, as I mentioned, is usually done in access concentration where we're on our meditation object, we're off a little bit, we're on it, and we, we start learning how to, new ways how to use it. But um, jhana is when we are concentrated. In jhana one, there's a little bit of thought, it's in the background. In jhana two, there's no thought. Jhana three, the primary aspect of that is that it's very, very uh, joyful, very like an energetic joy. In the fourth jhana, the uh, or the third jhana, uh, the uh, I have to back up a little bit here. In third, in third jhana, it's just the the blissful aspect of the practice, blissfulness and single pointed concentration. In fourth jhana, it's single pointedness, and then what comes in is equanimity. Everything is exactly the way it's supposed to be. There is no right or wrong, or there's no duality. And we could go on again. We could go on and on, you know, about this. All of these subjects with the eightfold path, they have their own, they have their own stories, you know. But the eightfold path is a, a combination of all of the paths. When when the eightfold path is represented, represented, it's like a uh, a wheel with eight spokes to it, and and the you know there, there there's the hub, and then there's the the the, uh, the cap you know where everything comes together and and these all represent these are all part of the path and if we have a wheel with eight spokes on it if one of those spokes is missing it doesn't turn right it just doesn't work out right and so what we want to do is is stay with each one of these areas of the eightfold path and and practice them all be aware of them all and one of the easy ways that we can do that is by understanding each area of the path. Ask yourself, what is, you know, what is the, the first step? You know, what is the second step? What is the seventh step? What is the eighth? And kind of test yourself. And it's not complicated. Uh, one of the ways that I remember um, the Eightfold Path is by you, um, uh, U-T, and then the, the rest of the word is sale, S-A-L-E, and then with mindfulness and concentration. So this is just a way that I remember it. U-T is understanding and thinking. Sale is, is the, the word sale means speech, skillful speech, action, livelihood, and an effort. And then the concentration, or the meditation, and I'm sorry, mindfulness and concentration are the, the final two, the seventh and eighth steps, or the seventh and eighth spoke you know, of the Eightfold Path. This is one of the ways that you can memorize them. But once, once you understand them, you'll see that they all fit together. And, and practice them all as one. Be moral. You know, look for the, the wisdom teachings, they have the understanding, and, and the, the correct thinking, that wise, skillful thinking. And the practices, you know, the effort and the mindfulness and the concentration, they're all a part of the path. And they, they, won't, they will not lead you astray, I can guarantee that. So uh, I hope this has been beneficial for you. 
Um, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to, to teach this. Um, it's, it's a wonderful, I have the best job in the world, what can I say? So uh, again, I hope this is beneficial for you and thank you very much for, for staying tuned and watching these. Thank you.